Good afternoon and welcome to the Manhattan Resource Efficiency PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ben Goldsmith, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for organising this. And thanks to everyone listening. Um, we're really grateful to have the opportunity to tell you about how things are going. Um, we assume that most, if not all, the people on this call will know us. So um, I think we're going to skip the idea of um, a kind of personal introduction. Um, and we'll jump straight into what Manhattan's about and um, what, what we're attempting to achieve for shareholders. So the, the, the vehicle has been in existence since July 2015. And the goal is to emulate the best characteristics of some of the other permanent capital uh, vehicles that are listed in London today. RIT Capital, for example, whose chief executive, Graham Thomas, whose former chief executive, Graham Thomas, is chairman of our investment committee and a, and a founding partner in, in the management company of Manhattan. Or, or Caledonia, which is backed by the Kayser family, you know, there's a bunch of different investment trusts in London that are permanent capital and therefore able to take a long term approach in in uh, in in the way that they invest. And they're able to flex their asset mix according to how they see the world. Um, at the same time as investing in publicly traded securities, they can get involved in slightly more esoteric private equity, private credit positions and so on. And in fact, the family backed ones have done best because the families themselves tend to have networks that, that enable access to those kinds of deals that aren't ordinarily accessible. So that, that was our goal, was to launch a vehicle that, that would look a little bit like one of the listed London family offices in that sense, um, but to use that vehicle to address the, the, what you might describe as the green industrial revolution that is undoubtedly underway. You know, open any newspaper, business or otherwise, and in, in almost every page is an article about the, the, the striving for for net zero and at the heart of that story in our opinion is is the move within all industrial sectors to use resources much much more efficiently so not just energy but raw materials water waste streams and so on this is especially in light of the recent geopolitical crises in ukraine and so on with with substantial increases in volatility across most commodities every industrial sector is now scrambling to use resources with much greater efficient, efficiency and, and to achieve net zero in line with the Paris Accords. And that throws up a huge business opportunity, not just for those who are delivering the, the, the technology and the know-how that, that, that makes those efficiency gains possible, but to companies who are leaders within their sectors, who are producing the same product as their peers or better, but using much lower resource and energy footprint to do so lower emissions and so on. So that's kind of how we define green. We, we don't really call ourselves a green fund or a sustainability themed fund in contrast with my previous business, Web Asset Management, which is a, a two billion long only equities manager with a sustainability focus. We talk about energy and resource efficiency. That That's um that's what we do. Um, so the, the team, well, having said we went to the background just very briefly, I founded Web Asset Management previously came out of Hargreave Hale, private wealth manager before that. Graham Thomas was at Goldman's for a long time, chairs our investment committee now. And, and um, he was for five years chairman of the executive committee at RIT um, and now runs a private equity group called Stage Capital. And Luciano is going to be um, talking in a bit, but he's our CIO, um, lead portfolio manager. Um, he is the risk manager in the business. And investment committee decisions are taken unanimously by me and... Graham and Luciano. Um, I tend to focus day to day more on the running of the business and on unearthing and executing private equity, private credit transactions. And Teddy's our, our, our investment analyst. Um, um, we've the, the, the manager is a separate entity. So we are an outsourced investment manager. Um, and the board, the independent board of directors of the company, uh, 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 delegates portfolio management to us. Um, the reason why we asked Sarian Cheshire to chair the business is because he, alongside Stuart Rose at Marks & Spencer, was one of the first FTSE 100 chief executives to take energy and resource efficiency really seriously within Kingfisher. 
um, Kingfisher owns B and Q and Castorama and all those home homeware stores. And um, both Stuart Rose and Ian Cheshire unleashed these massive capital programs of, of resource efficiency, everything from LED lighting in the stores to fuel efficient trucks and so on. And both were somewhat pilloried by shareholders and by the city, by journalists for, for, for the scale of that investment. But both demonstrated very, very quick financial paybacks for, from those those investment programs. And so Ian was a perfect person to have in charge of the board of an, of an investment trust focused on this resource efficiency story. Um, Duncan Budge is an investment trust veteran. Um, it's been in and around Jacob Rothschild's orbit for a long time and Artemis and a bunch of others. Howard Pierce ran public sector pension funds and Barbara Donahue has investment banking and a family office background. Um, so the vehicle is, um, it's long only, we don't, we don't, we're not a hedge fund, but we are a multi-asset vehicle. So we can buy publicly listed securities, equity or credit, and we can do private investments, private equity, private credit, and, and, and more on our approach to both of those shortly. Um, but the goal is to run a concentrated portfolio. So kind of typically we've held 15 to 20 positions at any one time. And our biggest positions have been as much as 25% of the portfolio. So we want positions that we really believe in, that we really understand, that we can talk about fluently. Um, and we want them to matter. We, we, we don't want to be over diversified, especially with a small team. And, 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 and in the context of the long term approach we take, you know, we, we think that makes sense. We, it's very low turnover. We tend to buy stuff with at least a three to five year um, uh, goal for that position. Um, and we tend to re underwrite each position in our portfolio sort of on a six monthly or nine monthly basis. Um, um, uh, as well as running a watch list of an additional 15 or so positions that we like, but which may not be at the right price point now. Um, so in terms of the trends that we're trying to, um, that we're trying to address, um, it, it, the, the principal trend is one of resource use. You know, the, the global economy has been completely profligate in its use of resources across the board. I mean, just here in the UK, we waste 50% of the food that we grow. 50% from farm to fork ends up in the bin. Um, and that's true of all industrial sectors. We just have a linear consumption model where we extract stuff from the ground, use it tremendously inefficiently, and then chuck it as garbage back into the ground. And, and there's now a very rapid pace of change taking place across all industrial sectors. And that's throwing up interesting opportunities and, and, and particularly opportunities for business to establish themselves um, uh, uh, a much stronger competitive positioning than previously. Um, so we, we think in, in an age of disruption and innovation, you know, competitive moats under siege we've put in the deck, um, we want to find businesses which are um, able to defend those moats, that, that are able to differentiate themselves sufficiently that they have pricing power. So companies with monopolistic or, or oligopolistic characteristics appeal to us, um, but within this broader th frame of, 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 of efficient use of resources. Um, if you look at the Venn diagram, this is kind of how we think about every position that, 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 we, that we look at. Um, does it fit thematically? And it, it's pretty broad. I mean, if we just said green, you know, what does that mean? I mean there's a hundred different meanings. Does that mean only renewables? Um, so we think resource efficiency is, 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 is a plenty broad enough to have an addressable universe that, 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 that occupies us our time and, um, and fills our portfolio with the best ideas that we can find. Um, in the prospectus, we say uh, uh, businesses which are either delivering or directly benefiting from the more efficient use of resources. So it would be difficult to imagine a fossil fuel company or a bank finding their way in there. Uh, but but across most industrial sectors, we can find stuff to look at. Um, quality is essential. So we don't do small stuff. We don't do um, uh, small caps, mid caps. We We tend not to invest in companies that haven't been around for very long. We like companies that are well established, which have strong balance sheets and which have cash flows that we can understand and that we can predict with some degree of comfort. Um, 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 uh, cash flows, which, uh, which, we, we, which, we, which we can forecast with some degree of comfort. Um, and most of all, companies which have pricing power, which we think is important in current inflationary environment. So companies which have this, this strong competitive positioning that matters so much to us. And then value. Um, I wouldn't say we're a value fund, but I'd say that valuation forms a principal pillar of our investment strategy. 
Um, we, we don't buy, for example, uh, 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 market participants that are leading in, in very growthy sectors where the multiples are very high and where share price is predicated upon maintaining aggressive rates of growth. We, 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 um, we're very mindful of valuation and, and you might almost say we're a kind of Buffett school investor in, in that way. Um, so the portfolio is, is, is um, we're able to invest 50% in liquid stuff and 50% in illiquid stuff broadly. Um, in practice, I think it's unlikely we would have as much as 50% of the portfolio in, in private investments. Um, but but our, our method on private investments is to get into deals that are being led by blue chip investors that we know through our network. So I spent a lot of time uh, developing and um, making new relationships with the world's best private equity infrastructure and real estate investors. Um, and when they do deals that fit our sweet spot and where they'll allow us in on preferential terms as a minority co-investor, then that's when we look at stuff seriously. So we've, we, we apply the same Venn diagram to private investments as we do to public investments, but with the added layer that we don't want to lead deals. We're not capable of leading deals. So we've co-invested three times with KKR's brilliant infrastructure team out of London. Um, we've had two exits and, 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 and another is in the portfolio. Now it's our only substantial private position at the moment in the portfolio. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and we've co-invested with Apollo once a New York real estate um, an infrastructure manager, um, and we've made a, a very successful private equity investment in Brazil as well, alongside a leading infrastructure player there. So it's it's really about network. We, we've we've spent a lot of time developing these relationships. <clears throat> We're able to add value in certain ways in 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 respect of these deals, and we've got ourselves in a position where we get shown stuff. <clears throat> we get shown deals of it might be might be four, five, six hundred million dollar deal, and we come in as a minority co investor with ten or fifteen million. Um, and um, that, that's all we'll do on the private side of things. Um, we, 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 we currently have very little in the portfolio because we had a slew of successful exits in 2020 and 2021, um, and nothing we've seen in the last year um, justifies the price being paid for it, in our opinion. We think that the, the arbitrage between private opportunities and public markets has sort of evaporated, and we think there's a tendency on the part of some of the bigger private uh, equity, particularly in the infrastructure side of those private equity firms, to, to overpay just on the basis that they've raised some massive funds, five, 10, 15 billion dollar funds. They have to deploy them. And in the market we're in, that they tend to be heaping debt and, and we think overpaying. And so we we haven't co-invested, having looked at lots of things in the last year, we've, we've done very little. Um, so, um, um, and we always, we, we, we have the ability to maintain cash according to how we feel about the world. And that varies between uh, one and ten percent, typically. Um, so it's working. I mean, we, we after a choppy start. Um, conveniently for Luciano, he arrived at exactly the bottom of that graph um, in 2016. Um, we've compounded at approximately ten percent net of fees for seven years now, um, with surprisingly low levels of volatility. So the approach that we've adopted is working. The portfolio has more than doubled in the period since we, we've had a full team and Luciano joined as CIO. Um, and um, we, yeah, we, we don't plan on changing stuff because what we're doing is paying off. And uh, it's worth mentioning that we have our money where our mouth is. So we, between us, own 25% of the share capital of Manhattan. Um, and um, so we've been buyers uh, during the last few years. Um, so these are, these are the top positions. Um, you see, we're quite concentrated. Um, and I think at this stage, I might introduce you to Luciano, who can um, talk through some of these positions as to why. We have some dedicated slides on some of these coming up, Luciano. I don't know if you also have the ability to change the, yeah. the deck. Yeah. So as, as you can see in the presentation, um, the, all the companies that we own um, are very high quality. They are either monopolies, oligopolies, or there's very high entry barriers in all of them. I'm going to focus, uh, I think, probably on Alphabet because there's been a lot of questions about Alphabet and ChatGPT and the competition coming from, from Microsoft. Um, I think it's quite interesting to mention that um, this the narrative when 
uh, ChatGPT was um, came out and, and Microsoft bought a 49% stake in, in OpenAI was that basically that um, uh, that the Google was going to be disrupted and that um, Microsoft was basically going to eat a big portion of, of that pie. And as uh, the products have been released uh, um, and people have been seeing the results, um, the technology is still not uh, at uh, at the right uh, place to 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 deliver to deliver the results that people expect. Plus the fact that uh, now the market has basically there's a lot there's been a lot of discussions about the the nature of the search business, right? Um, the majority of the search uh, business, the, the the ones that are more valuable for for Alphabet are the structured. Uh, searches where large language models don't add a lot of value. Um, the other very interesting point is that the majority, close to 50% of the uh, searches on, on Google, they relate to um, uh, businesses and services that are near us. So you need to, you're looking for a specific shop, a restaurant, a product or a service near where, where you are. At, a, at any, any given time. Um, in that sense, I don't know if any of you have tried to use Bing for that, but uh, the product doesn't work very well. Whereas um, Alphabet with Google and Google Maps, they, they already built a very powerful combination uh, service where you can access and, and, and find local businesses very easily. Um, it's very unlikely or very difficult for any shop on uh, any retail business, lo local re uh, retail business to pay again to, to, to advertise on Bing uh, when they, they already um, are paying for, let's say, for Google and uh, they see the benefits from that. Um, the, the structure searches as well, like when you're looking for things like... Uh, flights or or tickets or any kind of product where you need to compare large language models don't add any material value um, so the the likelihood that the alphabet uh, business is going to be uh, disrupted uh, easily it's not uh, it, it's not so clear um, the 50 more than the, in terms of revenues around close to 60 percent of revenues come from search but um this if we look at the valuation of alphabet it's very interesting to point out that they are trading at uh, probably around 14 times 2024 earnings that's a very cheap value for such a high quality company and then when we look at the at the constituents if you do a sum of the parts uh, valuation we see that uh, um, there's 120 billion uh, dollars of cash. Um, YouTube could be worth north of 200 billion. Um, Google Cloud another 200 billion. Um, it's uh, there's there's other businesses within Alphabet that uh, the, that are doing really really well and they are not uh, reliant on advertising. The the likes I don't know if you uh, are aware, uh, but uh, uh, YouTube Music now has 80 million uh, subscribers by the end of 2022. It had 50 million at the end of 2021 and 20 million at the, hand, at the end of 2020. The, the, the service is comp very com uh, comparable to uh, Spotify, YouTube Music. And uh, this is a very interesting value proposition. The pricing that uh, uh, now uh, YouTube Premium is offered is approximately 11.99. In the UK, eleven ninety nine pounds per month. With that, you get YouTube Music and you get um, uh, YouTube all the videos uh, and all the content without any ad ads, which makes it a lot more a, a much more compelling proposition than than just owning Spotify. In the case of YouTube Music, you have more content because you have not only the the songs but you also have the video. So that's that's. Um, just just to show like uh, that there are other areas within the company that are um, growing in terms of revenues. Um, the, the, the narrative has also been that uh, effectively um, ChatGPT has disrupted and, and that uh, 
that technology is superior to, to Google. The truth is that uh, ChatGPT currently, uh, OpenAI has currently 240 employees approximately, whereas just DeepMind uh, in, in Alphabet has more than a thousand uh, full-time researchers. Um, then you have Google AI, which uh, we estimate that probably the size is probably similar to, to, to DeepMind. So the, the, the truth is that the, the, bat, the first battle has been won by Microsoft and the narrative story, but uh, we think that uh, the war will, will take a long time. And we, we think that it's going to be very difficult for Microsoft to disrupt, uh, to disrupt, uh, to disrupt Google. Um, in terms of valuation, we think that uh, the, at, the current, at the current price, you probably benefit from an IRR north of 20% um, in the case of, uh, of Alphabet. So we'll just, just pause there and um, should we just look at some of the questions in the Q&A and then we can move on and talk more about more companies in the portfolio. Um, so there's a question about Excelio. Um, some of you may have seen that... Um, Brookfield, the, the Canadian infrastructure giant, is in late stage negotiations to acquire the whole share capital of Excelio, in which uh, um, which represents eight percent of our portfolio. We're a minority co-investor alongside KKR in that deal. Uh, we're currently showing um, a little better than a two times ROI unrealized on that. Um, we've also realized some of the profits um, with with distributions that have taken place. Um, in, in, in previous months. Um, so soon, our largest private position is likely to have been sold. But that's a solar asset developer. It's a perfect example of the kind of deal we want to be doing alongside these private equity firms. Um, it's a blue chip uh, developer of renewables assets, focusing in geographies where you have lots of sunshine, high electricity prices, and a stable regulatory regime. So Japan, for example, or Mexico, places where solar makes perfect economic sense without any kind of government fiscal incentives at all. Um, and the team at Excelio have been, um, as well as clipping the coupons from their existing pool of assets, which which underwrites the, the downside story of, of, of this investment, they've been very canny in developing new ones and very commercial in how they sell those assets. They sold all of their Spanish assets to China Three Gorges Corporation opportunistically about a year ago, um, which resulted in a big distribution to shareholders. So we'll, we'll be sorry to see that go from the portfolio and we wait with um, bated breath to find out what deal has been agreed between Brookfield, KKR and, and the other sellers. Um, we did it. We did it more recently a co-investment with KKR in John Lang, which is a portfolio of renewables assets and a, a bunch of other infrastructure, um, uh, not, not totally different from Excelio, except that it's a, a broader diversity of, of, of infrastructure types. Um, so that's Excelio. Um, a couple of people have asked about um, a couple of people asked about dividends. Um, uh, so, so we, we obviously with the board, we talk in every board meeting about buybacks and dividends. Um, this is a hot topic for investment trusts. Ultimately, it's up to the board to decide, not us, um, to what extent the company should be paying a dividend and to what extent the company should be engaging in buybacks. Um, a lot of shareholders don't want dividends. Um, because they don't want a, such a high tax distribution of, of of capital from the vehicle. They would prefer buybacks, if anything. And there are others that, that do want dividends, and they're roughly equally split. Um, as far as buybacks go, uh, the issue is that um, our goal is to get bigger and to increase liquidity in the stock um, and to reduce the total expense ratio. And we'll do that through compounding. The portfolio at the current rate of compounding is roughly doubling every six or seven years, so, so it uh, and um, and has doubled during the last six years, um, and so a buyback simply works against that goal, which is to to reduce the size of the vehicle. That being said, the discount uh, broadened substantially in in recent months um, to beyond thirty five percent recently, and at that point, the board the board decided to authorize a buyback. So buybacks have started, and you'll find out more about those on the website in the RNS announcements that have been put out. But Numus has been. Um, instructed by the board to 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 buy some of the company's stock back in, um, and that's had an effect. The share price is up twelve or thirteen percent since we announced that buyback um, several weeks ago. So we we think of of the two options, buybacks are better um, um, on the basis that we get an almost fifty percent return immediately upon buying in and cancelling the shares at the current market price. Um, 
and we think that it's a more efficient use of capital from a tax perspective than, than distributing it as dividends. Uh, but it, it's all up for grabs. And if people want to talk more about that, then then the chairman is all ears. Um, Sorry, in Cheshire. Um, uh, uh, there's another question about um, about the justification for a fund management fee, bearing in mind we have quite a concentrated portfolio. And um, I, I guess my answer to that is that um, for a start, a lot of the private deals that have delivered equal or better returns than the public portfolio are not accessible to, to, to many investors. And so in part, you're paying a management fee to access those off-market deals. Um, but also the mix of, of investments, be they publicly traded investments or private investments, at the discretion of the manager is worth something. And it's produced among the best returns of any of the multi-asset investment trusts in London during the last six or seven years at the portfolio level. And I, I, in my opinion, whether you pay a management fee to someone who's running a 90 position index tracker or a more concentrated long only fund or, or even a long short hedge fund, it's, it's, it's all the same. You're, you're paying for someone else's judgment, um, expertise and judgment and uh, in respect of the risk management of the portfolio. And um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Luciano, but the question here is with, with such a concentrated portfolio, you know, shareholders could theoretically buy these positions themselves. Why would we pay fees to manage? Yeah. And I think ultimately, it's, ultimately, it will be uh, uh, dependent on the performance. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, super concentrated or not concentrated. What you have to assess is performance. And as you, as Ben mentioned, um, we, I think, we are one of the best performing uh, investment trusts uh, in the last six, seven years. Yeah. Um, so we talked about buybacks, we talked about dividends, we talked about concentration, we talked about justification for management fees. Um, another question was was in respect to the discount at which the share price trades um, to the net asset value and, 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 and buybacks being one solution. The other solution is this, um, webinars introducing the trust to a broader audience. We've done lots of that. We've, Luciana and I were in a podcast last week, and it's fair to say we haven't paid enough attention to marketing the, the, the investment trust to prospective buyers in the way that, that we ought to have done. And that might have had a bearing on the share price. And we're making up for that now. Um, it might be because we've been so focused on on rebuilding the portfolio and and, and, and delivering great risk adjusted returns. It might be that we own 25% of the vehicle and therefore we've been remiss. E either way, here we are on this webinar and um, these, these tend to have a good effect. Uh, we've also been tipped in, in, in some of the investor magazines and so on recently. We have tipped by Merrin Somerset Webb and others in, in Money Week, and we've had some good commentary out in the last three or four months. So um, we, we'll see how that pans out. Um, so in terms of the slides, um, uh, um, so we've talked about Google. This is all Google, I think. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Uh, sorry, I can't quite see it. We've talked about Microsoft. Uh, why don't, uh, Luciano, I think it might be good. In, uh, please, guys, keep, keep the questions coming into the Q&A, but why don't we talk about the North American railroads? Because together they make up a substantial chunk of the portfolio. Yeah, we, we, we love the, the North American railroads, uh, specifically because they are, very, they are a great inflation hedge, um, unlike the, the infrastructure, uh, the European infrastructure assets, which are basically concession asset you buy the concession for a limited amount of time um, in the case of the American uh, North American railroads you own the tracks so you own the asset and that's that's a perfect hedge they have excellent pricing power that was uh, shown during the beginning of covid when volumes plummeted and and revenue stays almost stable by and they managed to do that by hiking prices and we see we see that even in the inflationary scenario in the last uh, the last few few months they 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 keep uh, passing price and um, and and the results are are very 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 solid. Um, we expect an IRR close to 12, 13 um, percent from from the three positions we own, which are Canadian Pacific, Canadian National, and uh, uh, Union Pacific. Um, the other point that uh, we would like to make is the fact that uh, um, railroads are three to four times more efficient than trucks transporting goods. Um, we can see here that's the 
combined um, uh, the combined networks of uh, Canadian Pacific and Kansas City. Um, they will be, it's the first, uh, first and only uh, railroad that will have access from Canada to uh, the south of Mexico. And I think uh, here we're talking about uh, the discount and the, and the performance. Uh, I think uh, as there was that question about um, the, the fact of uh, dividends and buybacks, um, I think that the board did the right thing when the NAV discount uh, widened to close to 35%. Now it's less than 30% after the, the recent buybacks. And uh, you have to remember that at the 30% discount or, or a 33% discount, when you do buybacks, the return on capital is 50%. At 30% is 42%. So it's an excellent use of, uh, of capital. Um, the issue long term, if we want to in increase liquidity and um, we, need to, we need to keep growing because liquidity um, will, will, will improve once the, the fund um, materially in, uh, increases in size. I think we've done a very good job in the last seven years and uh, we, have to, we have to just continue. Um, in terms of prospective uh, re uh, returns, we see obviously with, the, with what happened in 2022, um, with rates going up, the multiples have contracted. Um, we see that the forward returns have increased, so the IRRs now are, are higher. We see a, a blended IRR uh, for, for at NAV level of uh, near 20% gross, which means that we probably can get to 18% uh, net. That would be at the NAV level. Um, assuming that we can narrow the discount, obviously that would be even higher than that. So overall, I think that we have a very compelling risk return uh, proposition with very solid companies. Um, we are fully aligned with investors. We own uh, uh, a big part of the of the trust, and the, either we perform, and in the case that there's no performance, you still pro there's a continuation vote in 2025, and um, if we haven't delivered, we would be probably you know we wouldn't be if we are not satisfied with the returns, we'll probably vote to to um, you know to not continue. Um, so, you know, I think this is difficult to find uh, any uh, investment uh, opportunity similar to with this um, discount and asymmetry of uh, risk return. I'd just like to jump back to some of the questions that um, have popped up since then. Um, uh, so we, we, we talked about Alphabet and Microsoft. How do they fit in the definition of, of resource efficiency? Um, Luciano touched on some of this, but th these companies are definitely at the vanguard of the drive for net zero and, 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 and efficient use of resources across the economy. I mean, for example, um, of all the tech businesses, Alphabet is the biggest user of electricity, and 100% of that electricity comes from renewable sources, both contracted in, but also from their own assets. Also, Alphabet has developed artificial intelligence technology that they apply to the energy use of their data centers, which are consequently among the most efficient data centers that exist in the world. Um, plus the self-driving technology, Waymo, and a whole range of different things that Alphabet are, are, are doing, which are um, really at the sharp edge of, of tackling the major issues around resource use and climate change. And similarly, Microsoft is absolutely one of the good guys when it comes to, to climate change. They're doing all, all sorts of things to reduce their uh, their footprint and um, right, right, right down to kind of um, going beyond net zero and targeting um, uh, uh, the, the questions have disappeared, sorry, uh, beyond net zero, but also, uh, also offsetting uh, their historic emissions since the company was even started. So, I mean, obviously there are shades of green um, uh, across the economy, but, but we consider Alphabet and Microsoft to be kind of leaders in this field, and, and we think that gives them a competitive um, advantage. Um, sorry, there's, so, there's yeah. one question that is uh, if we had any feedback uh, against uh, having such large positions, and what effect of that might have on this on the discount. Um, 
uh, yes, we this this some uh, investors that have mentioned that they feel uncomfortable, for instance, with Alphabet being so large. One of the things I would mention is that uh, currently um, almost half the position is uh, is profit. Um, so, and we are obviously uh, assessing um, the current scenario between Microsoft and, and Alphabet very carefully. Yeah. Um, sorry. So, uh, the viability relevance of a vehicle which has less than a hundred million free float. Um, so yes, yes, of course, of course we can vote our shares. I mean, the, the, in, in, in any situation, there's only one class of shares in the vehicle and, um, they're therefore all rank equal. Um, most of these vehicles started small. I mean, RIT started with the kind of 30 million of capital in the early 80s and traded at a persistent discount for a, quite a long period of time and has been one of the stalwarts of the London Investment Trust universe for decades since then. Caledonia similarly started very small, has never raised additional capital. Um, the Kayser family own significantly more than we do as a percentage of their vehicle. They own you know, around a half of the shares there. Um, so this is quite typical by way of a start. And, and, and if we keep compounding at the current rate, then we won't be a small vehicle for much longer. Now we've got, um, we've got 120 odd million of capital under management now. And you know, we, 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 we're optimistic that that can be a, billion, a quarter of a billion dollars, a quarter of a billion pounds within you know, six or 10 years. Um, that, 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 that we're, we're forecasting between 15, 20 percent IRR on the current portfolio. Um, so, um, um, we're, we're, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and, and we're not racing to be a multi-billion dollar asset manager. We're, we want to build a really smart, effective uh, multi-asset investment trust, um, which can exist for the very long term. You know, we're patient about it. Um, and performance has been excellent in the last seven years. Um, among the multi-asset investment trusts in London, we're, we're top, if not close to the top. Um, um, I think the Scottish Widows had half the fund in Tesla or something. So the doesn't quite quite count when I mean, they, they shot the lights out but we're we're right up there um among the best of, of, of all thematic interests um in in the investment trust landscape um um what are the very compelling the discount is so stubbornly high in absolute terms yeah the discount is stubbornly high i mean it, it, it the discount narrowed to kind of 15 18 percent a couple of years ago and stayed there for a while um um, we, th we think a combination of a buyback, which has now started with kind of a big marketing push um, and add to that the longer term effect of, of, of a growing track record I mean, seven year track record at approximately 10 percent net of costs annualized. That's pretty compelling, especially given the underlying portfolio is easy to understand and um, and, and of a very, very high quality. So, yeah, that, that, that's the opportunity here. You're, you're betting partly on the ability of us to find smart and interesting things to do in the private markets whilst uh, uh, generating great risk adjusted returns from a concentrated equity portfolio. But you're also betting on the discount narrowing back to a more normal level for a trust like this. It should be in the 15 to 20% range at the most. Um, and, and of course, if the discount is very persistent and, um, and, and, and we don't succeed in narrowing it, um, then there's also the, 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 the very real possibility that shareholders will decide to wind us up at the next continuation vote which is in two years time. Um, so I don't, I think we've reached the bottom of the questions. Does anyone have any more questions they'd like to add? Um, no, Ben, Luciano, thank you very much for that. I think you've actually addressed all the questions you can from investors. And of course the company will review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the investment company platform. But just before we direct investors for you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Ben, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, this is a long-term vehicle. This is one to buy and put away. You know, we, we've got our money where our mouth is. Um, we're completely focused on um, a, a, a decadal plan here to build a, a really solid kind of family office look-alike investment trust that produces top risk-adjusted returns and which is facing into the most important mega trend. Um, that, that exists in the world today. Um, so yeah, we're small, we're a bit illiquid, we traded a big discount, but I think that's an opportunity. If you're not in a hurry, I think it presents a really good opportunity to generate outsized returns. 
Perfect. Ben, Luciano, thank you very much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Manhattan Resource Efficiency PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.